You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner to English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a Collected Works volume number 93 by Rudolf Steiner. Twenty lectures around, and the title of it is The Temple Legend, uh, translated by John Wood. This is the second part and lecture 13 in the whole book, titled Concerning the Lost Temple and How It is to be Restored, Part 3, in connection with the legend of the True Cross, or Golden Legend given in Berlin on the 29th of May, 1905. Since we have spoken several times about Christianity and its present and future development, we have reached the point where today we have also to consider the meaning of the cross symbol, not so much historically as factually. You know, of course, what an all-embracing and symbolical meaning the emblem of the cross has had for Christianity. And today I would like just to shed light on the connection between the cross symbol and the significance of Solomon's temple for world history. Indeed, there exists a so-called holy legend about the whole development of the cross. In it, we are dealing less with the cross sign or its universal symbolical meaning than with that very special and particular cross of which Christ speaks, the very cross on which Christ Jesus was crucified. Now you know too that the cross is a symbol for all men, and it is found not only in Christianity, but in the religious beliefs and symbolism of all peoples, so that it must have the same common significance for all mankind. However, what particularly interests us today is how the cross symbol acquired its basic significance for Christianity. The Christian legend about the cross is as follows. We shall begin with it. The wood or tree from which the cross had been taken is not ordinary wood, but, so the legend relates, was in the beginning a scion of the tree of life, which had been cut for Adam, the first man. This scion was planted in the earth by Adam's son, Seth, and the young tree developed three trunks which grew together. The famous rod of Moses was later cut from this wood. Then in the legend, the same wood plays a role in connection with King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. That is, it was to have been used as a main pillar in building the temple. But then something peculiar came to light. It appeared that it would not fit in any way. It would not let itself be inserted in the temple, and so it was laid across a brook as a bridge. Here it was little valued until the Queen of Sheba came. As she was crossing it, she saw what the wood of the bridge signified. She realized for the first time what it meant that the wood formed a bridge to cross over the stream from this side to the other. After that the cross upon which the Redeemer hung was made of this same wood, and then it set out upon its various further travels. Thus you see that the point of this legend is to do with the origin and evolution of the human race. Adam's son, Seth, is supposed to have taken this scion from the tree of life, and it then grew three trunks. These three trunks symbolize the three principles, the three underlying forces of nature, atma, Buddhi and Manas, which have grown together and form the Trinity, which is the foundation of all growth and all development. It is apt that Seth, the son of Adam who took the place of Abel, murdered by Cain, should have planted the scion in the earth. You know that on the one hand we are dealing with the Cain current of evolution, and on the other hand with the descendants of Abel and Seth. The sons of Cain, who work upon the outer world, cultivate the sciences and arts in particular. They are the ones who bring in the stones from the outer world to build the temple. It is through their art that the temple is to be built. 
The descendants of the line of Abel, Seth, are the so-called sons of God, who cultivate the true spiritual part of man's nature. These two currents were always somewhat in antithesis. On the one hand, we have the worldly activity of man, the development of those sciences which serve man's comfort and outward life in general. On the other hand, we have the sons of God, occupied with the development of man's higher attributes. We must be clear about it. The viewpoint from which the legend of the true cross springs makes a firm distinction between the mere outward building of the world temple through science and technology and what, as religious element, works toward the sanctification of the whole temple of humanity. Only because this temple of humanity is given a higher task, only because the outer building, so to speak, serving as it does only our convenience, makes itself into an expression of the house of God, can it become a receptacle for the spiritual inner part in which the higher tasks of humanity are nurtured. Only because strength is transformed into striving for heavenly virtue, outward form into beauty, the words of man's ordinary intercourse into the words that serve divine wisdom, and thus only because the worldly is remodeled to become divine can it attain its perfection. When the three virtues, wisdom, beauty, and strength, become the receptacle of the divine, then will the temple of humanity be perfected. That is how the viewpoint underlying this legend looks at the matter. We must therefore picture, quite in the sense of this legend, that until the appearance of Christ Jesus on earth, there were two tendencies. The one was building the earthly temple and had its impact on the doings of men. So that at a later time the divine word that was to come to earth through the Christ Jesus could be received. A dwelling had to be prepared for the appearance of the divine word on earth. Alongside that, the divine itself should for a while evolve upward over the course of time as a kind of parallel tendency to the second current. Hence a distinction is made between the sons of men, the descendants of Cain, who were to prepare the worldly aspect, and the sons of Abel, Seth, who cultivated the divine aspect, until the two streams could be united with each other. Christ Jesus united these two streams. The temple had first to be built outwardly, therefore, until in the shape of Christ Jesus he should arrive, who was able to raise it up again in three days. On the one hand, then, we have the current of the sons of Cain, and on the other that of the Abel Seth line, both of which are preparing the development of mankind so that the Son of God can then unite the two sides and make the two streams into one. This finds expression in the holy legend in a profound way. Seth himself is the one who planted the scion that he had taken for Adam from the tree of life and raised a tree with three trunks. What is the meaning of this triple-stemmed tree? Nothing else at all than the trinity Atma, Buddhi, and Manas the threefold higher nature of man, which will be implanted in his lower principles. But within man this is veiled at first. Through his three bodies, physical, etheric, and astral, man is at first like an outer covering for the real divine trinity, Atma, Buddhi, and Manas. You must imagine, therefore, that the trinity of physical, etheric, and astral body are like an outer representation of the higher forces of Atma, Buddhi, and Manas. And just as the artist fashions outer forms or expresses a certain idea in colors, so these three coverings also express a work of art. If you conceive these higher principles as the idea of a work of art, you will have come halfway to grasping how the life of these three bodies is made up. Now, man is indeed living in his physical, etheric, and astral sheaths, together with his eye, through which he will so transform his threefold nature 
that the three higher principles find their appropriate dwelling place and feel at home here on earth. That had to be provided for by the old covenant. Through the arts of the race of Cain, it had to bring sons of men into the world, and through these sons of men were to be produced all the outward things that would serve the physical, etheric, and astral bodies. What outward things were these? The things which serve the physical body are firstly all that is contrived by technology to satisfy the physical body and provide for its comfort. Then, what we have in the way of the social and political institutions that regulate men's living together, what relates to nourishment and reproduction of the race, all serve the development of the etheric body. And, working upon the astral body, we have the sphere of moral codes and ethics, bringing the instincts and emotions under control, which regulate and raise up the astral nature to a higher stage. Thus, during the Old Covenant, the sons of Cain were building the three-tiered temple. In all this, since it is made up of our outer institutions, in which you can include our dwellings and tools, the social and political organs, the system of morals, is the building of the sons of Cain that serves the lower members of man's nature. The other tendency worked alongside, presided over by the sons of God, their pupils and followers. From this stream come the servants of the divine world order, the attendants of the Ark of the Covenant. In them we find something which, as a separate current, runs parallel to that of those who serve the external world. They occupied a special position. Only after Solomon's temple had been erected was the Ark of the Covenant to be placed inside it. That is to say, everything else had to be made subservient to the Ark of the Covenant, to be arranged around it. Everything which was formerly of a worldly nature was to become an, an external expression, an outer covering for what the Ark of the Covenant meant for mankind. The meaning of the Temple of Solomon will best be understood by whoever visualizes it as something that expresses outwardly in its physiognomy what the Ark of the Covenant should be in its soul nature, S-O-U-L. What has given life to man's outward three bodies has been taken by the sons of God from the Tree of Life. That is symbolically expressed in that building wood later used for Christ's cross. It was first given to the sons of God. What did they do with it? What is the deeper meaning of the wood of the cross? In this holy legend about the wood of the cross lies a very deep meaning. For what in general is the task of the human being in his earthly evolution? He has to raise the present three bodies with which he is endowed to a higher stage. Thus he must raise his physical body to a higher realm and likewise his etheric and astral bodies. This development is incumbent upon humanity. That is the real sense of it. To transform our three bodies into the three higher members of the whole divine plan of creation. There is another kingdom above that which man has immediately and physically around him. But to which kingdom does man in his physical nature belong? At the present stage of his evolution, he belongs with his physical nature to the mineral kingdom. Physical, chemical, and mineral laws hold sway over man's physical body. Yet even as far as his spiritual nature is concerned, he belongs to the mineral kingdom, since he understands through his intellect only what is mineral. Life as such he is only gradually learning to comprehend. Precisely for this reason official science disowns life, being still at that stage of development in which it can only grasp the dead, the mineral. It is in the process of learning to understand this in very intricate detail. Hence it understands the human body only in so far as it is a dead mineral thing. It treats the human body basically as something dead, with which one works as if with a substance in a chemical laboratory. 
Other substances are introduced into the body in the same way that substances are poured into a retort. Even when the doctor, who nowadays is brought up entirely on mineral science, sets about working on the human body, it is as though the latter were only an artificial product. Hence we are dealing with man's body at the stage of the mineral kingdom in two ways. Man has acquired reality in the mineral kingdom through having a physical body, and with his intellect is only able to grasp facts relating to the mineral kingdom. This is a necessary transitional stage for man. However, when man no longer relies only on the intellect, but also upon intuition and spiritual powers, we will then be aware that we are moving into a future in which our dead mineral body will work toward becoming one that is alive. And our science must lead the way, must prepare for what has to happen with the bodily essence in the future. In the near future, it must itself develop into something which has life in itself, recognize the life inherent in the earth for what it is. For in a deeper sense it is true. It is the thoughts of man that prepare the future. As an old Indian aphorism rightly says, what you think today that you will be tomorrow. The very being of the world springs out of living thought, not from dead matter. Outward matter is a product of living thought just as ice is a product of water. The material world is, as it were, frozen thoughts. We must dissolve it back again into its higher elements, because we grasp life in thought. If we are able to lead the mineral up into life, if we transform it into the thoughts of the whole of human nature, then we will have succeeded. Our science will have become a science of the living and not of dead matter. We shall raise thereby the lowest principle of man, at first in our understanding and later also in reality, into the next sphere. And thus we shall raise each member of man's nature, the etheric and the astral included, one stage higher. What man formerly used to be, we call in theosophical terminology, the three elemental kingdoms. Bracket, see the chart at the end of the notes to lecture 10, end of bracket. These preceded the mineral kingdom in which we live today, that is, the kingdom to which our science restricts itself, and in which our physical body lives. The three elemental kingdoms are bygone stages of evolution. The three higher kingdoms, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and the human kingdom, which will develop out of the mineral kingdom, are as yet only at a rudimentary stage. The lowest principle in man the physical body, must indeed still pass through these three kingdoms, just as it is at present passing through the mineral kingdom. Just as today man lives in the mineral kingdom with his physical nature, so in the future he will live in the plant kingdom and then rise to still higher kingdoms. Today with our physical nature we are in a transitional stage between the mineral and plant kingdoms, with our etheric nature in transition from the plant kingdom to the animal kingdom, and with our astral nature in transition from the animal kingdom to the human kingdom. And finally we extend beyond the three kingdoms into the divine kingdom, with that part which we have in the sphere of wisdom, where we extend in our own nature beyond the astral. Thus man is engaged in an ascent, this is not brought about by any outer contrivance or construction, but by the living self which is awakened in us. This does not use mere outward building stones, but works in a creative and growing way. This force of life must enter into evolution and must first take hold of man's innermost being. His religious life must be gripped by living forces. Therefore, what the sons of Cain did for the lower members of man's nature during the Old Covenant was a kind of preparation. And what the prophets, the guardians of the Ark of the Covenant, did was like a prophetic forecast of the future. The divine should now descend into the Ark of the Covenant, into the soul, so that it may itself dwell in the temple as Holy of Holies. 
Adam, the first man, was already endowed with the tree of life, with these living forces of metamorphosis and transformation, the creatively working forces that reshape nature. But these forces were entrusted to those not engaged in the work of outward building, to the sons of God, the sons of Abel and Seth. Through Christianity, these forces should now become common property. The two streams should unite together. And it is basically a Christian attitude today, which holds that nothing external, no temple, no house, no social institution, ought to be created that is not irradiated with inner life, with a life-giving force, rather than the mineral force that can only manipulate things. The first attempt which was made to guide the lower nature of man to a higher stage was Solomon's temple, as we have seen. The Pentagon was to be seen at the entrance as the great symbol, for man was to strive for the fifth principle of his nature. That is to say, human nature had to raise itself up from the lower principles to the higher. Each member of man's being was to be ennobled. And here we come to the cross's real meaning, which has led it to acquire such basic and real significance as a symbol of Christianity. What is the cross? There are three kingdoms toward which mankind is striving, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and the human kingdom. Today man finds his reality in the mineral kingdom, to which plants, animals, and man belong. You should see it as it is meant in all creeds of wisdom, that man as a being of soul and spirit is a part of the universal soul, the world soul, as Giordano Bruno, for example, called it. Perhaps the individual soul is like a drop in the world soul, which we can imagine as a great ocean. Now, Plato said about this, that the world soul has been crucified on the world body. The world soul, as it is expressed in man, is spread out over the mineral kingdom. It must raise itself above this and evolve upward to the three higher kingdoms. Hence it must become incorporated in the plant, animal, and human kingdoms during the next three rounds. The fourth round is nothing else than the incorporation of the human soul into the mineral kingdom, the fifth round into the plant kingdom, the sixth into the animal kingdom, and finally the seventh round is the embodiment of man into the human kingdom proper, in which man will become wholly an image of the Godhead. Until then, man has to take the world body as his sheath three times. If we take a look at mankind's future, it presents itself to us as threefold materiality, vegetable, animal, and human. This human substance is not the same, however, as the substantiality we have today for the latter is mineral, since man has, indeed, so far only arrived at the mineral cycle in his evolution. Only when the lowest kingdom has become the human kingdom, when there are no more lower beings, when all beings have been redeemed by by man through the force of his own life, then he will have arrived in the seventh round, where God rests because man himself creates. Then will have come the seventh day of creation, in which man will have taken on the likeness of God. These are the stages in the story of creation. Now plant, animal, and man, as they stand before us today, are only the germ of what they are to become. The plant of today is only a symbolical indication of something that is to appear in the next human evolutionary cycle in greater glory and clarity. And when man is overcome and stripped off animality, he will have become something of which today he is only a hint. Thus the plant, animal, and human kingdoms are the three material kingdoms through which man has to pass. They are to be world body, and the soul has to be crucified on this world body. Be clear from now on about the respective positions of plant, animal, and man. The plant is the precise counterpart of man. There is a very deep and significant meaning in our conceiving the plant as the exact counterpart of man, and man as the inverse of plant nature. Outer science does not concern itself with such matters. It takes things as they present themselves to the outer senses. 
Science, connected with theosophy, however, considers the meaning of things in their connection to all the rest of evolution. For, as Goethe says, each thing must be seen only as a parable. The plant has its roots in the earth and unfolds its leaves and blooms to the sun. At present the sun has in itself the force which was once united with the earth. The sun has, of course, separated itself from our earth. Thus the entire sun forces are something with which our earth was at one time permeated. The sun forces then lived in the earth. Today the plant is still searching for those times when the sun forces were still united with the earth by exposing its flowering system to those forces. The sun forces are the same as those which work as etheric forces in the plants. By presenting its reproductive organs to the sun, the plant shows its deep affinity with it. Its reproductive principle is occultly linked with the sun forces. The head of the plant, the root, which is embedded in the darkness of the earth, is on the other hand similarly akin to the earth. Earth and sun are the two polar opposites in evolution. Man is the inverse of the plant. The plant has its generative organs turned toward the sun and its head pointing downward. With man it is exactly the opposite. He carries his head on high, oriented toward the higher worlds in order to receive the spirit. His generative organs are directed downward. The animal stands halfway between plant and man. It has made a half turn, forming, so to speak, a cross piece to the line of direction of both plant and man. The animal carries its backbone horizontally, thus cutting across the line formed by plant and man to make a cross. Imagine to yourselves the plant kingdom growing downward, the human kingdom upward, and the animal kingdom thus horizontally. Then you have formed the cross from the plant, animal, and human kingdoms. That is the symbol of the cross. It represents the three kingdoms of life into which man has to enter. The plant, animal, and human kingdoms are the next three material kingdoms to be entered by man. The whole evolves out of the mineral kingdom. This is the basis today. The animal kingdom forms a kind of dam between the plant and human kingdoms, and the plant is a kind of mirror image of man. This ties up with human life. What lives in man physically, finding its closest kinship with what lives in the plant. It would take many lectures to confirm that thoroughly. Today I can only hint at it. When man wants to maintain his physical life activity, he can best do so with a plant diet, since he would then be consuming what originally had an affinity with the physical life activity of the earth. The sun is the bearer of the life forces, and the plant is what grows in response to the sun forces and man must unite what lives in the plant with his own life forces. Thus his foodstuffs are, occultly, the same as the plant. The animal kingdom acts as a dam, a drawing back, thereby interposing itself crosswise against the development process in order to begin a new flow. Man and plant, while set against each other, are mutually akin whereas the animal and all that comes to expression in the astral body is the animal, is a crossing of the two principles of life. The human etheric body will provide the basis at a higher stage for the immortal man, who will no longer be subject to death. The etheric body at present still dissolves with the death of the human being. But the more man perfects and purifies himself from within, the nearer will he get to permanence, the less will he perish. Every labor undertaken for the etheric body contributes toward man's immortality. In this sense it is true that man will gain more mastery of immortality the more the evolution that takes place naturally in him is directed toward the forces of life, which does not mean toward animal sexuality and passion. Animality is a current that breaks across human life. It was a retardation, necessary for a turning point in the stream of life. Man had to combine with animality for a while, because this turning point had to take place. But, 
he must free himself from it again and return again to the stream of life. At the beginning of our human incarnations on earth, we were endowed with the force of life. That is symbolically expressed in the legend where Adam's son Seth took the scion from the tree of life. This was then further cultivated by the sons of God and is an expression of that threefold human nature which has to be ennobled. After that, Moses cut his rod from this wood of life. This rod of Moses is nothing else than the external law. But what is external law? External law is present when someone who has to erect an external building has a plan, that is, a systematic scheme on paper, so the outward building stones can be shaped and fitted together according to the plan. Thus the law underlying the plan of a state is external law. Mankind is under Moses' rod. And anyone who follows a moral code out of fear or in hope of reward is only following the external law. Moreover, whoever looks at science only in an external way is only following external law. For what else can there then be in it but external laws? All the laws we are acquainted with in science are such external laws. Through them, however, we will never find the way to higher human nature, but will only follow the law of the Old Covenant, which is the rod of Moses. However, this external law should be a model for the inner law. Man must learn inwardly to follow law. This inner law must become for man the impulse of life. Out of the inner law, he must learn to follow external law. One does not make the inner law reality but by concocting a plan. Instead, one has to build the temple out of inner impulse so that the soul streams forth in the work of joining the stones together. He who lives in the inner law is not the one who merely follows the laws of the state, but they are the impulse of his life because his soul is immersed in them. And it is not he who follows the mo a moral code out of fear or because of reward who is a moral person, but he who follows it because he loves it. As long as mankind was not ripe for following the law inwardly, as long as man was under a yoke and the rod of Moses was present in the law, so long would the law lie in the Ark of the Covenant until the Pauline principle of grace came to man giving him the possibility of becoming free from the law. The profundity of the Pauline doctrine lies in its making a distinction between law and grace. When law becomes inflamed with love, when love has united with the law, that then is grace. That is how the Pauline distinction between law and grace is to be understood. Now we can follow the legend of the cross still further. The wood was used as a bridge between two river banks because it did not suit as a pillar in Solomon's temple. This was a preparation. The Ark of the Covenant was in the temple, but the Word become flesh was not yet there. The wood of the cross was laid as a bridge across a stream. Only the Queen of Sheba recognized the worth of the wood for the temple, which should live in the consciousness of the soul of all humanity. Now the same wood was used for the construction of the cross on which the Redeemer hung. He who unites the two earlier currents of evolution, who allows the worldly and the spiritual to flow into each other, the Christ, is himself joined to the living cross. That is how he can carry the wood of the cross as something external which he carries on his back. He is himself united with the wood of the bridge and can therefore take the dead wood upon himself. Man is today drawn into higher nature. Formerly he lived in lower nature. In the Christian sense he now lives in higher nature, and the cross, the lower nature, he carries forward as something alien through his inner living forces. Religion now becomes the living force in the world. Now the life in external nature ceases. The cross becomes entirely wood. The outer body of man now becomes a vehicle for the inner living force. There the great mystery is consummated. The cross is taken on man's back. 
Our great poet Goethe presented the idea of the bridge in a beautiful and significant way in his fairy story of the green snake and the beautiful lily, where he portrays a bridge being built by the snake laying itself across the river as a living bridge. All the more advanced initiates use this same symbol for one and the same thing. Thus we have become acquainted with the deep inner meaning of the holy legend of the cross. We have seen how the turning point was prepared, which Christianity brought about, and which must be fulfilled more and more as time goes on by Christianizing the world. We have seen how the cross, inasmuch as it is the image of the three external bodies, dies, how it is only able to form an external union between the three lower and the three higher kingdoms, between the two banks divided by the stream. The wood of the cross could not become a pillar in Solomon's temple until man recognizes it as his own particular symbol. Only then, when he sacrifices himself, makes his own body into the temple and becomes able to carry the cross, will the merging of the two streams be made possible. That is why the Christian churches have the symbol of the cross in their foundations, thereby expressing the secretion of the living cross in the outward edifice of the temple. However, these two streams, the living divine stream on the one hand and the worldly mineral stream on the other, have become united in the Redeemer hanging on the cross. The higher principles are in the Redeemer himself and the lower ones in the cross. And henceforth this connection must now become organic and living as the Apostle Paul expressed particularly deeply. Without a knowledge of what has been discussed today, the writings of the Apostle Paul cannot be understood. It was clear to him that the Old Covenant which creates an antithesis between man and the law, must come to an end. Only when man unites himself with the law, takes it upon his back, carries it, will there no longer be any contradiction between man's inner nature and the external law. Then that which Christianity seeks to achieve is achieved. With the law, sin came into the world. That's in quotes. That is a profound saying of Paul's. When is there sin in the world? Only when there is a law which can be broken. But when the law becomes so united with human nature that man only does good, then there can be no more sin. Man only contradicts the law of the cross as long as it does not live within him, but is something external. Therefore Paul sees the Christ on the cross as the conquest of law and the conquest of sin. To hang on the cross means to be subjected to the law, and that is a curse. Sin and the law belong together in the Old Covenant. The law and love belong together in the New Covenant. It is a negative law which is involved in the Old Covenant, but the law of the New Covenant is a living positive law. He who united the Old Covenant with his own life is the one who has overcome it. He has at the same time sanctified it. That is what is meant by those words of Paul which are to be found in the epistle to the Galatians, chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, quote, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Close quote. With the word tree, literally wood in the German Bible, Paul connects the concept with which we have been dealing today. We must indeed keep penetrating deeper into what the great initiates have said. We do not come closer to Christianity by adapting it to what might be termed our demands, by adapting it to the contemporary materialistic judgments that deny anything higher, but by continually raising ourselves further into spiritual heights. For Christianity was born of initiation, and we shall only understand it and be able to believe that it contains infinite depths if we abandon the view that we have to bring Christianity nearer to contemporary ideas. Instead, 
We must raise our anti-spiritual, materialistic way of thinking back again to Christianity. The contemporary view must raise itself from what is mineral and dead to what is living and spiritual, if it is to understand Christianity. I have presented these views so as to arrive at a conception of the New Jerusalem. Answer to a question. Question, is the legend very old? Answer, this legend existed at the time of the mysteries, but it was not written down. The mysteries of Antioch were Adonis mysteries. In them was celebrated the crucifixion, the entombment, and the resurrection as an outer image of initiation. The mourning of the women at the cross already appeared there. This appeared to us again in the persons of Mary and Mary Magdalene. This links up with a version similar to that in this legend, which is also to be found in the Apis and Mithras mysteries, and again in the Osiris mysteries. What was still apocalyptic there is fulfilled in Christianity. The old apocalypses change into new legends in the same way that John portrays the future in his revelations. Second answer. The legend is historically medieval but was previously recorded in all its completeness by the Gnostics. The further course of the cross is given there. Moreover, the medieval version also contains indications of this. The medieval legends indicate the way to the mysteries less clearly, but we can trace them all back. This legend is connected with the Adonis mysteries, with the Antioch legend, in which the crucifixion, entombment, and resurrection become an outward image of inner initiation. The mourning women also appear there, and there is a connected version which is very similar to the Osiris legend. Everything that is apocalyptic in these legends is fulfilled in Christianity. The Queen of Sheba sees deeper and is versed in the true wisdom. Footnote, text 1 is taken from Seiler's notes, text 2 from those of Rebstein, and that is the end of lecture 13.